thanks very much. So I'm going to be, I'm going to talk about the status of sablefish as a commercially ready species for U.S. marine aquaculture. And for those who are not familiar with sablefish, it's also called black cod, and actually in the market and restaurants, it's usually referred to as black cod. It's a deep water, long-lived species, has wide distribution across the Pacific from California to Alaska, over to Japan, and up north to the Bering Sea, um, to Russia. The, it has a commercial fisheries. Uh, it's currently level. It's not overfished, but it's highly regulated, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. It's one of the highest valued fin fish per pound in the Pacific fisheries, and it's not necessarily uh, in the world. And its uh, market is uh, primarily Asian. It's historically, the market has been in Japan. And when the, uh, the economic situation in China was better, uh, there was a lot of uh, imp importing to there and then also to uh, Korea. And that's what the, the uh, fisheries looks like. And you can see it's, it's fairly stable um, over here. And in 2016, it was about 20,000 metric tons, but you can see it's very low compared to historic values. Okay, so getting into why it's a commercially viable species, there are companies that actually produce sablefish. Um, however, they're not in the U.S., they're in Canada. Uh, two of them are shown here, Golden Eagle Sablefish Canada, and a newcomer is Hub City Fisheries. It's been producing for a couple of years now, but this is the one that's been there for a long time. Uh, both of these go from eggs to a net pen grow out. They have their own net pens. And in the case of Golden Eagle, they also have F1 broodstocks. But unfortunately, in the U.S., there's no fingerling producers. There's also no uh, grow out. And in the past, Trout Lodge Marine Farms uh, produced fingerlings, sablefish fingerlings. They also have some grow out in Hawaii and Kona. Uh, Icicle did a little bit of grow out uh, at the Manchester station in uh, Puget Sound, but not very much. And currently, there's interest by this company, Global Blue Technologies, which is a recirculation aquaculture company that's primarily uh, dealing with shrimp, uh, but now wants to expand into uh, sablefish. And perhaps there's interest by Cook Aquaculture in the Puget Sound region, and there definitely is interest by the Jamestown Sklalem tribe that's also in Squim, Washington. So this is the production cycle for sablefish going from eggs up to commercial product. In this case, the commercial product is about two and a half kilos or 5.5 uh, pounds, and that's based on the commercial fisheries market. And there could be smaller size markets as well uh, developed in the future. And uh, this takes 36 months if you're growing out in net pens in the Pacific Northwest with mixed sexes. And the other thing I point out here is that this uh, phase from embryos to uh, the larval stage appears to be long. It's about uh, it's it's fairly long, but that's at five degrees centigrade, and really. You're just putting them in incub incubators and silos. So you're really not doing anything with them there. So it's just a long time while they're sitting there. So let's talk about each one of these components. So broodstocks. And most of what I'm going to be talking about is what is actually occurring at the, uh, the NOAA Manchester Research Station um, in Washington, in Seattle. Um, and the reason is, is because there's no U.S. production right now. And I'll, I'll also uh, utilize some information from the Canadian production as well uh, when needed. So for us, we use uh, wild brood stocks, which we collect them by, by long line. And that looks kind of tough, but actually it's very easy. If you know a commercial fisherman that, has, that knows where these fish are, uh, you're actually getting them from real deep, like 1,000 feet, but they have no swim bladder. They have no pressure problems. You just bring them up. And the next day, they can be feeding in, in tanks. So they're very, very hardy fish. Uh, and so getting wild broodstocks and using them is not a problem. However, at, uh, at NOAA, at the Manchester Station, we have been producing captive broodstocks since about 2010 or, or 11, uh, really uh, largely in 2012. Um, and I also mentioned that they've already been developed to some extent in Canada at the Golden Eagle Sablefish Canada uh, facility. And I just put this down here to show you that there is a significant difference between families, and this is a single pair of crosses of one male, one female, in uh, terms of growth performance. So this means that if you can do genetic selection, you can likely uh, decrease the time to uh, commercial harvest. And uh, the things, the caveats that you should uh, know about developing broodstocks is that uh, these broodstocks have to be maintained at 5 degrees C year-round. Remember, you're getting them from 1,000 feet down, so it's very, very cold. And in order to get them to reproduce, they have to be maintained at that temperature. They mature late at about six years. And interestingly, we think that there's precocious male development 
Um, but most males also probably reproduce at about six years. And I think that there may be some issues with tank rearing of these broodstocks, but that may be related to the size of the tanks that we're using, so we have to uh, maybe look into that a little bit more. So going on to the uh, fertilized embryos, um, as many of these fish that have been talked about today, this is a batch spawner. Um, say a three to four kilo fish will spawn about four to six batches in a reproductive cycle. It does it at a 24 to 48 hour frequency. Each one of the batches is maybe 50 to 60,000 eggs, so totally the fecundity might be between a quarter of a million to 500,000. So certainly not as fecund as some of these fish that have been talked about earlier, but uh, fairly fecund, so we really don't have too much of a problem getting eggs. Uh, they will not initiate that spawning or that cycle voliciously, so they have to be induced. But the methods for induction are well worked out. Uh, they use ov uh, ovaplant or gonadotropin releasing hormone injections, either one of those. And those methods are in this paper. That paper is not related to spawning induction, but it's in the, the general methodology. We also determine when to take eggs uh, from the broodstocks using ultrasound. Uh, and this just shows you four panels here going from uh, non-stimulated through oocyte maturation through here to ovulated eggs that are channelized and ready for stripping. All of those methods for ultrasound have been worked out uh, a long time ago. They're also in that paper uh, that I described uh, earlier. The methods for, to optimize fertilization and cryopreservation have also been worked out. And they're in this paper. Um, and generally, cryopreservation is really not necessary for this fish because the, the males uh, produce copious amounts of sperm, so that's not really an issue. But there are certain conditions, and I'll mention a little bit later, where cryopreservation is probably going to be important. But all of that is, is worked out. So going to the larval phase, okay, just like a lot of these other marine species, uh, you have start with a rotifer phase, overlap with artemia, and then artificial diet. At 12 degrees C, that takes 50 days. And really what we're trying to do all the time is contract that, that period and try to make all of this uh, much more economical. And one of the things we've been doing lately is to try to emit the artemia phase, go directly from rotifers to, to uh, dry feeds. This is just preliminary data, but with certain uh, larval diets like Otaheim, uh, you can actually do that, tran that transition. And with higher temperatures, they're feeding more voraciously and you can actually get them onto the dry feeds better. So I think we can accomplish that and get them onto dry feeds uh, much earlier. We've done a lot of work with uh, rearing at different larval temperatures, mainly to try to get them to grow faster in the larval phase and to contract that period. And you can see that um, at 50, or 12, 15, and 18, there's an increase in the growth of the larva. But at 18 degrees, you get a decrease in the survival. So the optimal temperature is about 15 degrees. And that's 6.7 in, in a 500 liter tank. And we've seen like a kind of a mass action effect of survival. So if we use a eight foot diameter, 4,000 liter tank, which is really a commercial tank, we can have a survival of 20, about 25 to 50%. So the survival is pretty good. And that's all covered in those papers as well. So the other thing that's really expensive about this phase is the use of green water, which some people have described. Um, so we've tried to substitute uh, clay for it, and in this paper describes that substitution. It's very successful. As long as you start with one week of green water and then go into clay, you have better survival uh, in them than you would if you used uh, nano or if you used uh, just green water. So that really is, a, is an important thing because it really decreases the cost of this phase. So the most important thing about the juveniles to grow out is the sexual dimorphic growth. Um, females grow faster than males. This is a, a, grow, or a, a, a figure from Adam Luckenbach and, and uh, Bill Fairgrave showing the, grow out, or the, excuse me, the growth in, in grow out in a net pen. And you can see at about 500 grams, you start to get a bifurcation of the female and the male growth. So before I said that the, the market, the market uh, size is about 2.5 kilos. So if that is what you're going for, you definitely want to be growing all females. And remember, probably you don't remember, but in the very beginning I said it takes 36 months to get to that size if you're using mixed sex. And if you use all females, it takes 24 months. So you shave off a whole year. And we've actually done that in our own net pen, so, so we, we know that that, that works. 
Uh, so Adam Luckenbach and Bill Fairgrave worked out the methods to produce these all-female stocks, and basically it's to produce neomales that have XX sperm that we cross with XX females to produce all females. We've been using all females for like three or four years, so it's something that has already been developed. Disease. These are pretty hardy fish, but one of the problems is frunculosis with atypical Aramona salmonocyta. So it's not like salmonid uh, frunculosis. There is a vaccine uh, that is available through Aquatactics uh, that's based in Washington. And this vaccine is based on local isolates from our net pen. Um, and it's an, injectable, it's an injectable vaccine, and the efficacy of that is in this paper. You can see it here. The one thing we don't know about that is how long that vaccine is good for. There are no sablefish-specific diets, and that's a real problem, and I think that's been alluded to in a number of the species that's, that have been discussed before. At the larval stage, Odeheme is the best larval diet um, that's off the shelf, and it works quite well, so I don't think we really need to develop that. But for grow out, we really don't know the diets that work best. We use EWAS Dynamic, which has a fairly high lipid uh, amount in it, and it appears that this fish needs a very high lipid amount in the diet for, the, for grow out. And we don't have a brood diet either. So I said what we have, what we still need is in the brood stocks, we need to generate, continue to generate these captive brood stocks and go through genetic selection, since I think we can actually decrease the time to commercial market by doing that as well as using all female stocks. Um, there may be a little bit of an issue with egg quality and the fun fecundity is high, but it's not that high, so we might need to increase uh, the egg quality for some females, so we have to work on that. Uh, as I said before, we need to continually optimize this larval rearing stage. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to uh, continue the live feed omission and the contraction of that phase because it's the most expensive phase and we have to, uh, to really make that less uh, expensive. And then for feeds, uh, we need what is called life stage specific and performance optimized diets. And that's a quote for Bill Fairgrave, who's in the, in the audience. He's a nutritional physiologist with me. Um, we can't go into details, but this fish undergoes different growth at different parts of its life cycle, like juvenile to adult in the grow out. And so we really need to have different diets at those times. We can't just use one diet. And those things haven't been uh, produced or optimized, and we need more nutritional information. For the disease, we need to get a better vaccine, I think, for frunculosis, and we need to look at different vaccine delivery. And for grow out, we need more platform testing in the U.S., so we need more net pen uh, platform testing, which we're starting to do at the station. We're going to have a net pen grow out uh, pilot scale project this summer. But we also need to look at other things like RAS and also submerged cages, because I think this is the best candidate for a submerged cage. Um, and also, we obviously need industry development because we don't have it. And with that, these are the people who did the work. I'll take any questions. Yeah. So one question. Oh, you're <laughs> stingy. I am yeah. stingy, yes. Rick, have you begun to work with selective me. breeding into the all-female? Yeah, it's a complicated thing, obviously. We can select on both the neo-male side as well as the normal female side, and we have not. We basically produce neo-male broodstocks every year as well with the idea that we would do that in the future, but it's, it's something that we need a quantitative geneticist involved in that because it's going to be a complicated thing. But yeah, that's what we want to do.